Good morning, or oh, buenos dias, I should say. Um, when I was first uh, invited uh, to this conference, which um, is a total honor, and thank you so much to the committee for inviting me, I thought maybe I'll get to uh, speak in Spanish, um, <clears throat> but no such luck. So maybe some will come out um, during, this, uh, during the session. Um, so I am a uh, program officer um, at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And the foundation is a large labyrinthian um, place um, that has three divisions. They are uh, global development, uh, global health, and US programs. So I work in US programs, um, and the strategy overall is uh, education driven. And it's uh, especially um, great to be here with you all uh, because the work is rather US centric, right? Um, and we, we've really got to, um, uh, education and our problems are so similar. Um, we are one of those countries that thinks um, we are a superpower, um, and, um, and our education system um, is, you know, among the poorest, um, for, especially for the kids um, who make up the largest percentage of the, of the public school systems. And I'll, and I'll go into that a little bit. So um, I'm going to start um, by giving you um, what I hope are, is what you will get from this talk. Um, and it's ambitious. Um, I'm, at, at the moment, I'm going to go fast. Um, we have to, I think we have a, set, a time later um, so we can go a little deeper. Um, but, um, you, and everything I say is Googleable. Um, so know that. Um, so um, I'm going to um, try to hit these five points. Um, games um, as uh, learning spaces, um, the state of the field, at least in the US, um, and I'll say now that part of my work, I have a very lucky job um, that I get to find partners with whom to create relationships um, and, um, and collaborate. Um, and so, you know, part of my being here the next few days is to, if those of you who are working in games and or are interested in adaptive technologies, do, you know, do reach out to me. I'd love to just get a sense um, from the audience, how many people here actually are working in adaptive technologies or games and learning? Can I just get a sense? Good. So it's about 30% of you. So um, perhaps we'll, we'll get some converts um, by the end of, of this talk. Um, so um, I want to give you a sense of the field. Um, the educational achievement landscape, at least in the US, um, which is very similar actually to um, South Africans, um, landscape, um, and I'm sure similar to many of your countries. Um, the Gates um, Games Learning and Assessment Strategy, that's what GLA stands for. Um, I will offer an example or two of our investments in this space um, and, um, and share a little bit about uh, learning Im impact um, and market data. So I'll end um, with, some, with some good news. Uh, which we didn't have until recently, right? We've been in this space for some 10 years. I, I would say the field has matured um, over the last 10 years. The field is older than that, but in the last 10 years, um, it's really accelerated. Um, and we've been doing that without much data, with just sort of like the hope that maybe this is a good idea. So I just want to tell you a bit of a personal story of how I wound up um, here in games. I started my career as a teacher, um, and then a school principal. Um, and I had a parallel career for a bit. Um, I made a film about my family. Um, I followed my family for five years with cameras while I was a school principal. Um, and I grew up um, very poor um, in New York City um, on public assistance, attending some of the worst schools in the, in the country. Um, and, and so, I went, I, I got uh, lucky and went to fancy universities. Um, and when I went there, um, people had no idea what poverty was. Like it was this dirty little secret that we actually, that there's actually this 
pretty large population in the U.S. that lives um, pretty, you know, pretty in poor conditions. So what you see there is the, um, the picture of New Eureka Dream. That's the film I made, which HBO bought, and I got lucky, and you know, the film did um, well. Um, then I, after being a school principal, went on to um, run a consulting firm that designed 30 schools. Um, in New York City. So I was, I've been interested um, in the design of learning environments. Um, and the thing that you, that schematic that is barely visible, it's just a, you know, some um, uh, random schematic that show, tries to show um, a, uh, a connecting nodes of a system. And so the whole while, my passion has been about systems. How do systems work and how do we learn within systems? Um, the film is really was a reflection on the, on the system of poverty and the, and the choices we make within a system, right? How, the degrees to which we have agency within systems. Um, and so um, that has sort of been a theme um, in my work, um, which, and, and you'll see uh, how, you know, winding up in games um, was pretty easy from there because games are essentially systems of learning. I wanted to give you, um, and, and I'll talk more about that in, in a little bit. Um, just a sense of our situation, um, which I'm sure many of you in the audience know. Um, the, it, it, but these numbers are interesting. So we have eighth graders um, who, um, in the eighth grade, are telling us that 95% of them want to go to college. 74% um, of our kids overall graduate high school. Um, and then of those um, who graduate, 20%, so not that different from what Luis was talking about for South Africa, 20% are actually college ready, so have the literacy and numeracy skills that would actually make them um, successful um, in, and, and able to participate in a college program. Um, of, so the number goes all the way down. So the, the, the low income kids, um, and just to give you a sense of numbers, we have 50 million kids in public schools in the US. Half of those kids are low income um, minority kids, meaning receiving free or reduced lunch so that they're below the poverty threshold. Huge number. So 25 million of our kids um, are in that number. Of those, 8% graduate high school, I mean graduate college. Um, and the, you, know, I, you, you can see the numbers disaggregated a little better under there. Um, what we see is that irrelevance um, is cited as the number one reason, or one of the reasons, but it's a high number. It's like 68% of kids who, graduate, who, who drop out say that they do so because school just feels not for them. There is no reason for me to be here. Um, and so we do a really good job of designing schools that give kids that sensation, right? So, so, and I say a good job because any system um, is a system and, um, and it's well designed whether the output um, is bad or it is good. Um, it's a system that has a, a bunch of variables in it that are interacting to, to emit a result. Um, so this is, um, just to give you a more granular number, this is the number of kids who drop out of school daily in, in the U.S. But then this is also happening. This is sort of the digital landscape. And it's fascinating. Um, and it's, it's um, part of, um, you know, of the session that opened. Um, the, uh, for us, black and Latino students are um, between the ages of 11 and 18, spend 13 hours daily um, engaged with media. So, the, and you, you wonder how, could that be? Um, and as we all do, right? So uh, we actually, it's, it happens through multiple screens that we are now negotiating a multiplicity of digital content at the same time. Um, and that's a, from the Kaiser Family Foundation. 57% of kids, these, so these kids who are um, not going to school, um, during, while I was making this uh, movie, I would hang out in the neighborhood where my family lives and um, the, there are schools across the street from these uh, ad hoc computing centers where kids were buzzing um, and cutting school. There were schools across the street. They were playing games, doing other things. And 57% of, 
of kids are um, internet content creators. And this year, this number um, is old. This is a two, based on a 2005 number. What is interesting about this number is that kids in the lowest socioeconomic brackets produce just slightly more content, right? So that's interesting for us. And then there's this whopping number, right, that um, it so happens that 97% of kids, and, and this correlates to the UK. So it's the only other country, I would say, with whom we have a pretty um, symbiotic relationship in terms of collaborating, um, especially uh, several uh, organizations, one of them called Future Lab. Um, so we're in a field that's quickly evolving. The work started um, in, in places in Europe and in the US. And in the US, it started at MIT with Seymour Papert in the 80s that we had this notion, gosh, maybe games are good for learning. Um, and then um, things didn't quite work out. Um, there are a number of games, and the market sort of crashed. Uh, essentially, we were designing games with um, you know, the, the, the term people use is chocolate on broccoli, right? So the kids could smell um, the, the schooling that they were trying to be forced to eat, um, and the market essentially failed. Um, you know, I should say that my career um, was such that I, I uh, designed those schools, those 30 schools, was a school principal, and I, I switched um, at some point in, in, at the end of that work because I could, I could live happily ever middle class. The reform industry in the US is humongous, right? So there are many school reformers. We've been doing it for 100 years, and the results are abysmal. Like, the needle just doesn't move. Um, and, and, it, and there's something really interesting that in spite of the innovations of all of those schools, with great intentions and very talented teachers, they all succumb to the regimen of assessments. So we have an assessment system that dictates, essentially, um, in spite of the innovations, the assessment system will tell you what you should teach and how much kids need to memorize what you teach so that uh, they're successful on those tests. Um, so the, 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 the game strategy that um, we're doing very much follows that. So, um, and there was also another problem. I felt like we, I had learned lots about teaching and very little about learning. And I had been in education for 20 years. So that's, and, and that's a, a, an interesting concept, right? That we, we teach our teachers a lot about teaching. We actually don't know a lot about learning. Um, at least um, in the way that I was trained, in the way that I train many people. We can go through many steps, um, but what does learning mean? What does mastery mean? How do you actually become an expert in something? Um, and so, again, this is another reason why we don't want the big game. So in the 2000s, something huge happened, which is James G. happened, um, who is the author of a book, um, What Games Have to Teach Us About Literacy and Learning. Um, and the MacArthur Foundation, based on that book and also taking a turn away from, from school reform and saying, why don't we start paying attention to the kids? Maybe we have something to learn about what kids are doing that should guide our work. So the MacArthur Foundation put down $85 million to invest um, and create this games and learning field. Um, and now we're at a place where we think that um, games um, are not just good for learning. There are th enough qualitative um, and some quantitative analyses that tell us that in, the, in about 2005, we said, gosh, they're not just good for learning, but they might be good for assessment. Imagine this. So I'll, I'll tell you how in, in a bit. Um, what we are seeing um, is that games um, collect such huge amounts of granular data um, that we can really impose problems within a gaming environment um, and then follow very granularly the choices that kids make or that players make within those environments. And in fact, do be assessing them in a stealth fashion. Um, in other words, without having to give them a test um, that 
where they regurgitate information um, and actually never really solve complex problems. And in, within games, you can actually do that. You can actually create the immersive conditions where you solve a complex problem, where you apply skill and knowledge, and I will give you examples. I just wanted to give you a sense of our approach to this. Our work in technology is overall around personalization. How do we um, actually create the um, mechanics within technology so that we match a skill um, need and ability to learners? Um, and there are many, um, in many ways, that's, you know, there are technologies that are um, enabling us to do that. eBay, Amazon, um, and Google have figured out lots of ways to follow you, um, not at, you know, not um, with your permission, but they do, um, and have figured out how to create user profiles um, that, um, that tell, you know, personalize the experience that you have with, when you enter those environments. We, um, we follow, we, we are interested in those algorithms, and so our work is very much about how do we personalize uh, learning. Uh, we're interested in, um, in ac accelerating learning, especially for those kids who um, are furthest behind. Our work is unique as a foundation, and other foundations don't work this way. We really think about markets. We really think about what um, is the corporate sector doing, and, and how do we not fund a single point solution, like a one game, but how do we actually get the market to begin working in a way on both the supply and demand side so that it can be self-sustaining over time? And that's a complicated piece of work. Um, you know, and, and we do that on, on various levels, and I, I won't get into how we do that exactly, but I'm happy to talk about that later. We are um, really uh, rigorous about evidence and research. Um, in fact, this whole field is still much, very much R&D. We should be very skeptical, even about positive data, right? Um, it is, um, um, but we are, we're very much in an R&D state. And then um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about five design requirements. So anyone who comes to me with an idea to design um, a gaming environment, there are essentially five design requirements that um, you're going to tell me. Uh, OK. There are five design requirements that, we, that, that I look for, right? Um, and that is that your game um, can assess application. So we're no longer interested in um, um, assessing um, the degree to which you mastered a skill. We're interested in the degree to which you can apply the skill to solve a complex problem, right? So can you um, use your algebraic skill and knowledge to solve a problem endemic to a domain such as engineering? Can you take a problem in engineering? And, and, and so we're really interested in, um, um, in the issue of application. The common core standards that you see there in this might be foreign uh, territory. So the US, you know, in the 50 states, we've had um, different standards um, across the country, which, which created lots of um, painful heartache for uh, many um, uh, companies and, um, and for educators. And so what was um, mastery in Mississippi is very different from what mastery in Massachusetts. Um, is. So now we have the Common Core Standards, and about 44 states have adopted them. Um, so th those are, um, yeah, uh, standards that should guide us more uh, um, in a better way in terms of having equal um, expectations of kids. We want to assess complex skills. So complex skills is an, one of those terms that people call 21st century skills, non-cognitive skills, social-emotional learning skills. Right, it's the, so we have a bucket of terms for this thing. Um, we like to complicate things further, so we call them complex skills. Um, so, um, and so we're really interested in assessing things like collaboration and problem solving um, and communication. The, the, um, the very things that we saw this morning, people are telling us are actually most critical. Um, and so um, I should say that you know, the work um, that we're doing, um, by and large, um, is um, put, uh, in, in, in creating these types of games that assess these things, 
we are doing something that is kind of unprecedented and unchartered, um, is taking top game designers from top game design companies and top psychometricians from around the world. Those are assessment scientists. So we get these two groups together, right? And so assessment, for those of you who work in that space, is a very hairy job. It's a very complicated job to uh, establish validity around items um, and to be credible around what an assessment is. So, so we're actually coding assessments into the game, validated assessments um, into the games to measure um, complex skills um, um, and also traditional skills. This is another design requirement. Um, this is another, another. So these are things that now we can do today, right? We can give you very precise information about the degrees to which you're able to solve a problem, um, the, the, we, the degree to which you uh, actually applied your skill and knowledge. Um, so, the, and, and this is, you know, this, in the last um, five, six, seven years, we haven't really had the kind of technology where we can actually give you that granular level of data. Um, our hypothesis overall is that mastery is at this, you know, the sweet spot of mastery happens at this special intersection between very high engagement, where you're, you know, where it's just irresistible, you must return, you must return to do that algebra problem in that space. Um, it just is delicious and you can't wait to, to go back. So high engagement, and it's a great design problem for us, right? I mean, in fact, it's maybe one of the best design problems for us. How do we make things that just feel so alienating to kids who have been traditionally disenfranchised so engaging? And so high cognitive demand um, and high engagement, we believe um, that that's, uh, and that, that's where um, uh, mastery happens. And I, I should say, we believe, there's a whole field called the learning sciences, which is where I got my PhD, that tells us this. And the, the way that I got into games is because what we are seeing in the, res, in the research coming out of the learning sciences, which is a, about a 35-year-old field, is that the principles, the principles that are, um, are coming out of that work um, related to mastery development and expertise are actually the same principles that game designers figured out how to embed into, co into commercial games. So if you play Halo or World of Warcraft, those huge games that cost $35, $40 million to make a piece, um, the same principles are actually we're finding in those games. The games that, 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 that invite you to stay, to persist, to, to want to continue to solve problems. Um, I, I'd love just a, a, a check. How many people know about this game called Fold It? Oh, good. That's like three of you. So, uh, so this is good. So let me tell you about this game. So just so that I can sort of put into context how, how things um, can happen that are actually quite remarkable, right? So, um, so scientists for 15 years couldn't solve the protein structure of an enzyme that causes HIV. This game, Fold It, is a collaboration between um, uh, biochemists um, and players. We have 300,000 players in the, in the space right now, in, in the environment. And many of them are non-PhDs. Um, or people who have no science um, background. We're seeing the data is telling us that the kids, that the, P, the players without science backgrounds, the non-PhDers actually do better because the PhDers are afraid to take risks. Or, or so we think that that's the reason. But, but it's interesting that something like this remarkable um, can happen, that a group of some 10 kids from three different countries solve this, the protein structure of an enzyme that causes HIV in three weeks. So, so this, is, this happened um, because there are 17 skills that we identified. I shouldn't say we, I take no credit. 
this, um, this was, uh, it, I work closely with this uh, designer and we fund him and I'll show you an example of his work using the same engine. So it's a para, it's a, it's an adaptive engine um, that um, we, can, we can say, what are, what are the skills necessary to become a good protein folder, right? There are 17 of them, it's, it, it turns out. So we can create the novice to expert trajectories, right? What does it mean to be at the ground floor? We can create the novice to expert trajectories, and actually the game adapts for you as you develop expertise in those 17 skills so that you cre uh, cre develop a level of mastery necessary to play in the game. And you're, and you're um, collaborating with others, you play in teams, you are solving small challenges, you level up, just all of those conditions. But what's important here in this example is that you can create these immersive conditions um, where people can actually do the remarkable, right? Um, education, um, I think uh, since Dewey, um, we've had this dream that that's what education should be, that we should get people um, e um, immersed in, in places that are so meaningful to them that they that lead them to, to do amazing things. Um, this, is, this slide is sort of just thrown in there um, as a, an example of a place where um, this is the last school I helped design. It's in New York City. A second one opened in Chicago two years ago, um, and the results um, the learning results are, are, are pretty exciting about, uh, for this school. Um, again, all Googleable, um, and uh, it's a school where half the staff are game designers, half the staff are teachers, and every piece of curriculum is co-designed between designers and teachers. Systems thinking, um, as you'll you know, it, it, is a, a core part of this work. Um, as a, um, and, and so the, the curriculum is also framed around the systems thinking um, approach. It's Stephen Hawking who said that um, the, the, the 21st century will be divided um, by um, those countries who have learned to think systemically and those who do not. Um, the economic crisis in 2008 is a clear example of deficient skill, right, in, in, um, in systems thinking. I did my dissertation in system thinking. It is um, a passion. Um, so um, these are, I have about 17 labs that I fund and manage across the country. These are some of the games. I'm happy to share these slides um, and or um, anything. Uh, and these, most of these games are available for free. Um, the Institute of Place sort of sits in the middle there. It's an organization that I helped start and that I continue to work with. And I'm gonna give you an example. So now um, I'm gonna give you two examples and then wrap up. I have a, I have a question about time. Like, perfect. Um, so, so the guys who created Foldit um, created this game. Um, refraction. There, there, there are a set of mini games, um, and so what, what we're, it's a game that teaches you how to do fractions. I'm, you're not going to see the experience at length, but what you'll see is a sense of the analytics that we can collect that are pretty granular um, in the game. So the same engine, right, leveling you up through a set of skills. Refraction is a game about understanding fractions. Players must provide the right fraction of laser fuel to each spaceship on the board in order to save the creatures trapped inside. Players might need to split the lasers several times, or recombine them in creative ways. Initial studies have shown statistically significant learning gains on traditional validated math assessments after playing Refraction. The game has been played by over 300,000 people and has won two international game awards. Refraction is also a teaching and assessment tool. Its teacher control panel lets teachers access detailed information on students' performance on each common core concept. Using this information, teachers can customize the game by creating student-specific challenges targeting math concepts in a variety of ways, for example, by entering fractional expressions that are automatically converted into game levels. They can then assign those levels to the class or particular student, transforming homework into home play. While the students are playing the game, teachers can view mastery of key concepts across the students in a matrix. 
the matrix can show which students have achieved full mastery of certain math concepts, or it can serve to highlight concepts that seem to be problematic for most of the class. Teachers can also see the number of times each student works with each concept. If they want to drill down further, they can watch a replay of each game, which reveals the individual steps of a student's mathematical reasoning. The control panel also features suggestions on how to provide insight into a specific concept. Each concept contains an associated graph that depicts progression of the class on the concept for both struggling and advanced students. It can also show how this progression compares to other learners with similar demographics, and it can create projections of anticipated progress by using the data of thousands of other students who have already learned through refraction. Teachers can generate class discussion around animations and game levels specific to each concept. They can check their class understanding of prerequisite concepts in order to decide whether remediation of earlier concepts through gameplay might be most effective. Finally, teachers who significantly improve their class performance can submit strategies, giving each common core concept its own social support network. When taken as a whole, the fraction games with the control panel present an integrated system for enjoyable learning, student assessment, and teacher resources aimed for immediate impact. So what, what's interesting about this um, game um, is that uh, so we can do something that has also been unprecedented in education research, is that our sample size, um, our sample sizes um, are pretty huge. So the way that we, um, I keep saying we, I did not participate in Fold It. I, have, I, I now work with uh, the designer and I'm very lucky, his name is Zoran Popovich. So the, the, the way that um, those folks um, uh, figured out essentially how to help people develop skills is that we had these huge data sets. So we, when you have a data set of 30,000, 100,000 people going through the experience, what it tells us is what are optimal trajectories to put people on. Um, and so, you know, we have theorists who tell us that learning fractions, we, there, there are three or four major theories out there about what is the best way to learn fractions. Um, and they all fight, right? Um, and so what this does, it's agnostic to theory. We take all of those theories and say, huh, what does the data tell us about the best possible trajectories? So we can do very large um, uh, uh, testing of, uh, uh, with large uh, sample sets. Um, um, this is um, the other example I wanted to share quickly. I will only show you two minutes of this. This is online. Um, it's um, a game that, uh, so we, uh, the, my strategy in many ways has culminated in this project at, um, at EA, Electronic Arts. It is the largest game design company in the world. Um, and um, they develop a lot of tri what are called triple A games. So triple A games are games that cost $25 million or more to make. And um, I mean, so just think about that for a moment. Imagine that we spent $25 million in a classroom, right? Um, so n now we sort of can, because if we adapt these games um, in a way that give kids uh, meaningful learning experiences as we're doing with SimCity, um, it's, it's a pretty, pretty um, exciting uh, venture. And we're, this is, it's new for us, uh, these guys um, have just launched um, in, in, uh, last week this game, SimCity uh, Sim EDU, um, and, um, and, um, and I encourage you to check it out. Um, I'll give you a little bit of a demo. Again, this is the place where psychometricians and game designers are working together in one place. They're housed at EA. And I have fingers crossed that the internet is going to work out. It's moving real slow. I see something here. Maybe. The complexity of SimCity. OK. Brief video to show you a few of the features in our product, SimCity EDU Pollution Challenge. 
And what we've done is taken the commercial version of SimCity that was released by Electronic Arts recently, and in addition to adding our cloud-based formative assessment backend behind it, we've streamlined the game in order to make it playable in short sessions in the classroom. So whereas in the commercial version of SimCity you would have a big open field that would be empty and you would build a city up from scratch, in this case you have specific challenges that we've designed uh, for learning purposes. This is the third challenge in our product, so if it looks pretty complicated, that's because we have a couple of tutorial scenarios that take you through some of the uh, interface steps and get you used to the complexity of SimCity. So in this challenge, I've got to reduce the air pollution in the city without losing jobs. So I have a bivariate challenge intended to show the complexity of solving these kinds of real-world problems in uh, environmental science. So if I'm starting out, I might open up the tips and this will show me kind of how to move around a little bit. Maybe how to zoom in, check out the city, and how to rotate my camera. And I might go through a couple of more of those. You remember to hit pause, but I'm a kid, so I'm probably going to get impatient and close that. So I'm going to start by just looking around. It gets much better. Um, and I encourage you to, to watch it. I'm going to um, just wrap up. Um, by just telling you a, a little bit of the um, uh, data that's coming up. So we uh, recently did a meta-analysis. There were 62 studies that were identified actually in the field, um, and not many met the gold standard of, um, um, that, we, that we expect um, at, at the foundation and that most of us researchers expect. So the findings were pretty promising. Um, and so this is one of those things where my career could have ended um, because we've been uh, in this uh, space really um, hopeful that you know, maybe this is true. Maybe games could be helpful. So what we saw is that the, um, the effect sizes um, were strong to moderate um, and that compared to other learning conditions, including the classroom and including other technologies, um, kids uh, scored at 12 points higher, or 12% point, points higher um, than had they not. So that's pretty exciting. Um, this uh, is also telling us that the market is growing. Um, so, um, and, um, and I was just looking at this more carefully. Western Europe, if you see there, is actually the, the smallest number. So let's work on that together. Um, and um, um, with uh, Latin America showing the greatest growth um, over the next five years in the games and learning market. Um, but this is, this is pretty promising, um, at least for us. For, for, for um, investors, um, it's actually problematic, and I can talk about that later, because they think the market is even bigger than, than, than that data. Um, I will end by saying thank you for listening. Have a wonderful conference. Be playful. It is the way we learn. Um, and um, gracias. <laughs>